Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Roxanne Chabot from RBC Consultants, and thank you for joining us today for our Skin Chat webinar. Today, we're going to be covering what's new in UV research, exploring the impact of sun exposure on skin barrier. We have two presenters today, uh, Dr. Marek Haftek, who is Emeritus Research Director Dermatologist at the French National Scientific Research Center, former head of the Dermatological Research Laboratory at the University of Lyon in Lyon, France, and co-chair of 2019 GRC. We also have Dr. Charbel Bouez, who is Vice President, Advanced Research Americas, L'Oréal Research and Innovation, and President of EpiSkin SA France. We would like to thank our sponsor, CeraVe, for making this educational event possible. Before we begin, a couple of logistic tips. If you're having issues hearing the webinar, you can listen to the presentation using your telephone. Just select phone call and the audio pane, and the dial-in information will be displayed. If you're having technical issues, or if you would like to ask a question to our faculty, please submit your question in the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of this webinar, a survey will pop up in your browser and will be emailed to you one to two days after the webinar. We would greatly appreciate it if you could fill out this very short survey. And finally, within one to two days of the webinar, the recording of this program and a certificate of attendance will be sent to you via email. Again, if you have any questions for our faculty, please submit them on the right-hand side of your pane in the question chat pane on your screen. And I wrote you a little note there so you can see where to type them. We are going to be entertaining questions at the end of the webinar, time permitting. And now, without further ado, I would like to pass the floor virtually to Dr. Haftek. Hello, everyone. I hope you hear me correctly. Well, First of all, I would like to thank Roxanne for this introduction and uh, uh, Sarah V for inviting me to, to, to give a lecture on, on skin physiology mostly and the impact of UV uh, radiation on normal human uh, skin barrier. So, uh, starting with that, uh, you probably, most of you or all of you, know already how uh, the barrier behaves in uh, human skin. So this will be just in, in few words, a uh, current update on skin barrier research. Um, you can see here on the left side, the stratum corneum, as it shows in electron microscopy. And on the right hand side, you can see some typical uh, contact dermatitis uh, lesions that uh, make patients mostly uncomfortable. And uh, these uh, clinical signs may uh, re usually uh, persist for uh, uh, several, sorry, for oh, several- You're, you're muting the slides uh, rapidly, Dr. Haftek. Yes, I, I, I clicked two times, <laughs> okay. erroneously. Sorry for that. So uh, you can see here uh, the, the, the crosscut of, uh, of human skin. What is interesting for us is the upper layer of the epidermis, which is the product of uh, terminal differentiation of keratinocytes that divide in the basal layer and move through the successive intermediate level layers that are still living layers of the epidermis and they finish by um, uh, dying and uh, producing the final product of this differentiation which is the stratum corneum. So stratum corneum is the fine top level of, uh, of the epidermis that finally is uh, where the skin permeability barrier uh, sits. And uh, this is just amazing that uh, we need this upper part of the epidermis to uh, 
protect ourselves from uh, external um, impacts uh, like bacteria, uh, water, or uh, other chemicals. Mm, also against UV radiation because uh, 60 to 70 percent of UVB would be filtered already through this uh, uh, stratum corneum. The stratum corneum is composed of uh, corneocytes, which are just that uh, keratinocytes that are spread out uh, like kind of uh, dishes uh, that are sealed uh, within the stratum corneum by a mortar that uh, is mostly composed of lipids. So these lipids are hydrophobic, highly hydrophobic. Inside of the cells is still hydrophilic, but the composed uh, tissue, like the stratum corneum, is highly hydrophobic. So this will protect us from lose, lose, losing the, the water that is uh, in our body. We are composed of about 70% of, uh, of water. Um, and uh, also it will protect us from dissolving in, uh, in, the, uh, in the bath when you, you're taking one or swimming. So this barrier is uh, composed of cells and intercellular um, lipids. And you can see here that uh, uh, to stay uh, still uh, in place, these cells will have to maintain their connections like desmosomes that will integrate new proteins uh, into the extracellular part of the junctions and will become corneodesmosomes, which are much more stable um, uh, structures than usual desmosomes in the living parts of the body, of, this, of, of the stratum of, uh, of epidermis. So uh, these corneodesmosomes are composed of uh, transmembrane proteins, which are still cadherin-1 and uh, uh, desmoglein, desmoglein 1 and uh, desmocolin 1 and uh, corneodesmosin, which is a new protein uh, produced in the stratum granulosum, is integrated into this extracellular part, stabilizing the junction. Inside the cells, these junctions and transmembrane proteins are connected to keratin filaments through the uh, adapters, which are small proteins uh, that are used also in living cells for signal transduction. In the, uh, in, the, in the stratum corneum, this is no more the case because uh, all these proteins inside the cells and the, the cell membrane are cross-linked by transglutaminase 1, uh, forming the, these uh, cornified envelopes around the dead corneocytes but still these cells are con uh, connected. So what is important uh, for the uh, hydrophobicity of, of the stratum corneum is the lipids that, uh, that are present in the extracellular part of the, um, of the stratum corneum, the inter in intercornelocyte bases. And most of them are uh, in the molar ratio, uh, equimolar ratio are uh, ceramides, cholesterol, and uh, free fatty acids. Uh, when you look into uh, the percentage of lipids that are present within the extracellular space, uh, this is a little bit different. This is no more uh, equi, uh, equimolar ratio, but ceramides, um, are predominant species of lipids that are present there. And uh, that's why this is important to know that these lipids have not only structural role uh, in uh, producing with the other lipids the lamellar 
uh, arrangement of uh, hydrophobic and hydrophilic parts within the extracellular part of the stratum corneum and this lamellar structure is crucial for the function of uh, those lipids that uh, would not permit uh, modifications of uh, of the and, and transfer of uh, of water through the stratum corneum but uh, these lipids will uh, compose uh, i mean semermites with composed uh, uh, nearly 50 percent of uh, of their extracellular lipids in the stratum corneum so uh, you can see here uh, the percentage of those different lipids and you can see that that, that, that ceramides uh, are a predominant part of, of of the lipids present in the extracellular space uh, there are different subtypes of uh, of those uh, ceramides, uh, but uh, well, you can see that there is a nomenclature that is uh, uh, well established now. There are teams that look for those different subspecies of ceramides, and uh, we have about twenty different subtypes of uh, those molecules, but. Uh, what is important to know is that the length of the chain of the ceramides is very important for the, uh, the for the structure of the lamellar lipids in the extracellular part of the stratum corneum, and also uh, there are lipids of uh, a special kind that are omega uh, um, esterified lipids that would permit uh, the rooting of uh, some of those molecules in the um, lipid envelopes that uh, um, are created instead of uh, uh, plasma membranes of living cells around the corneocytes. So, um, well, probably, uh, these uh, these uh, ceramides are uh, modified in different uh, physiological and uh, pathological uh, uh, situations. And here are some examples. Uh, for example, in atopic dermatitis, uh, the ceramide one, which is uh, sp especially long molecule that would span several uh, um, lipid layers uh, in the layered uh, outer space uh, in the stratum corneum. Uh, this ceramide is very uh, neatly decreased in the, uh, in the atopic dermatitis skin in stratum corneum of the atopic dermatitis and this happens not only in lesional skin but most importantly also in non-lesional uh, skin of uh, of the subjects that are uh, developing this disease this results in uh, increase of transepidermal water loss uh, and uh, reduced skin hydration um, uh, so the barrier function is uh, ruptured in because of this uh, disequilibrium of uh, of uh, ceramides uh, expression in in atopic dermatitis. In psoriasis, this is mostly in uh, in the lesions that uh, things happen, and uh, there is an uh, inflammation involved, and the inflammation induces uh, several changes in the stratum corneum uh, related to hyperproliferation of the epidermis and uh, the, the, the barrier is not well uh, established in this case in the lesions of the of, uh, of psoriasis so this results of of course in an in increase in tool and uh, um, well acne vulgaris is a kind of uh, a special um, uh, example because uh, it has been reported that, the, that there is impaired water barrier function related to uh, 
decreased uh, levels of uh, ceramides and other sphingolipids. But uh, uh, what happens in Dacna vulgaris is, uh, is mostly the keratinization around the uh, hair follicles, and which is the cause of, uh, of, um, of the lesions. Uh, and we don't know yet how uh, this modification of ceramides in the skin of, uh, of the subjects um, uh, developing acne vulgaris uh, is related to the comedon uh, uh, production. Uh, well, in H dry skin, this is a problem of uh, metabolism, and uh, here uh, as well, uh, ceramides are, are, uh, are very decreased, and uh, this is combined with uh, loss of flexibility of the stratum corneum and uh, also uh, decreased barrier function of uh, uh, the skin in the elderly. But you may uh, remember that in the aged dry skin, uh, the stratum corneum is actually uh, more compact than uh, in uh, normal uh, young skin. So uh, these are just a few examples, clinical examples, but uh, uh, let's say uh, the, we can also look into the impact of uh, ceramides and the presence or, or increase or decrease of them, uh, looking into experimental models, not only in, uh, in the skin. Here, uh, this is just uh, 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 well, uh, some some examples of of uh, what happens in in atopic dermatitis. In atopic dermatitis, in lesional skin, you can see here uh, well, the mutation of filigrin uh, is uh, uh, is uh, producing the uh, in the lesions the disappearance of of uh, this protein from the stratum corneum. And when you say disappearance of the stratum corneum, uh, filagrin is also uh, the decrease of uh, uh, the, 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 the amino acids that result from the gradation of this, of this protein. And uh, when these protein uh, and these amino acids are no more uh, present in uh, right uh, levels in the stratum corneum, uh, there is a uh, dysfunction of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of the stratum corneum and uh, transepidermal water loss, and also the increased penetration of, uh, of foreign molecules and bacteria into the epidermis. Uh, the secondary barrier in uh, the living part of the epidermis is uh, made by tight junctions. And uh, also in the uh, lesional skin of uh, atopic dermatitis, you can see that there is a marked decrease of, uh, uh, of this protein. Uh, so supposedly also of tight junctions uh, in the in, in atopic dermatitis lesions. When you look into the expression of uh, proteins uh, that compose uh, uh, first desmosomes in the living layers and then corneal desmosomes in the um, stratum corneum, you can see that uh, in uh, non-lesional skin, this expression is rather low. And uh, when uh, there is an inflammation and uh, uh, response of, uh, of the living epidermis uh, and in this, in this uh, lesions, uh, um, there is an upregulation of uh, proteins composing desmosomes, which results in a persistence of uh, of and, uh, and irregular dec desquamation of of the stratum corneum uh, in the lesional skin. Uh, atomic uh, force microscopy uh, brings some new. Uh, elements uh, uh, showing that uh, when compared to uh, the normally looking healthy skin, whether filigrin is not mutated or only 
partially mutated. Uh, sorry, I have to go back. Can you please go back to the recent slide? Maybe I can do the okay. So, so yes, uh, this uh, in 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 the normal uh, normal skin, you can see that uh, there is a smooth sur surface of these corneocytes. When you look into the uh, into the lesional skin, uh, so this is atopic dermatitis, atopic dermatitis, uh, whether the filagrin is mutated on both alleles or only uh, on uh, one of them, uh, um, there is a, a immature uh, uh, aspect of the surface of, uh, of corneocytes and these little spots that you can he see, see here are the remnants of uh, um, corneodesmosomes that have been split by, by uh, um, tape stripping. So uh, there is uh this is a proof that uh, there is a lot of immaturity in in atopic dermatitis corneocytes when compared to normal uh, epidermis the normal uh, stratum cornea uh, ther theramide change in atopic dermatitis by uh, by patients uh, there is a uh, two things that will happen. As you could see previously, there is a, a disappearance of some species, subspecies of uh, ceramides, especially ceramide one and uh, long uh, spanning uh, ceramides that uh, are important for structuring the extracellular spaces and lamellar lipids within them. And the other thing is that there is a decrease in the length, overall decrease of length of all uh, um, lipids expressed in this inflamed uh, skin. So um, this uh, decrease is correlated uh, to uh, the uh, permeability barrier uh, function and uh, uh, to the transepidermal water loss in, uh, um, in, uh, in the epidermis in the stratum corneum of, of atopic dermatitis patients. Um, this is a very uh, interesting uh, um, paper uh, presented in Cuties uh, in which uh, um, the authors uh, report the very uh, striking modifications to uh, uh, to the ceramides uh, and the replenishment of uh, of uh, those uh, molecules within the stratum corneum when applied regularly and uh, on a long term um, topically. And you can see here that uh, they uh, they used uh, cleanser and uh, moisturizer con containing ceramides uh, to improve uh, the, the barrier function of uh, of the um, uh, of the skin, and this improvement of barrier function results uh, clearly in uh, improving of several uh, items. Um, concerning the quality of the of the barrier in uh, uh, in atopic dermatitis patients. Uh, also, this improvement concerns uh, the quality of life parameters. Uh, of course, when you improve the barrier, you have also in uh, an improvement in in, in in physiological, in in uh, what patients uh, feel like uh, uh, like relief from uh, uh, from the problems that they that they are uh, uh, suffering from uh, uh, during atopic dermatitis. Well, uh, here just a few examples of uh, of papers that are. Uh, still published uh, and, and, and continue to be published uh, uh, concerning 
uh, the impact of uh, of uh, replenishment of uh, of the stratum corneum in different uh, clinical situations with ceramides which uh, are apparently uh, the most important uh, um, species of lipids uh, that are present in the uh, stratum corneum and uh, this leads us to uh, uh, to um, consider uh, how uh, these elements, ceramides, and generally speaking, the skin barrier uh, is influenced by uh, sun, by exposure, everyday exposure uh, to um, to the uh, UV uh, rays, uh, and this part, this part will be uh, introduced by uh, Dr. Uh, Wes, uh, that will follow after uh, after my speech. But before he starts, uh, we'll uh, ask you um, a polling question. So. Um, this one uh, will uh, appear here, and we would like you to to, to ask this question uh, uh, using your um, uh, your interactive uh, screen of the, to the to the right of uh, of, the, of the of your screen. So, do you currently consider skin barrier management as part of your patient's sun care strategy? Uh, well, for a while, probably you don't, but uh, listening to to the second part uh, developed by uh, Dr. Buez, maybe uh, you uh, you uh, have a more precise uh, uh, opinion on, uh, on this. But please answer this question first, and we'll see how uh, your maybe your your, your opinion changes when you uh, listen to the second part of this uh, webinar. Yeah, so, uh, well, <laughs> uh, we have already some, uh, some hints about what you think, uh, and I'll, I'll now pass my microphone and uh, welcome to to Dr. Buez. Uh, I'll be back after, afterwards to conclude and to discuss with you uh, uh, the, the crucial questions that are introduced by, by Dr. Buez. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, uh, Mike and um, and Roxanne, first for organizing, and Mike, thank you for this introduction and the nice review of, of the ceramide sciences. Uh, hello, everyone. Happy to be with you today, and uh, thank you for this opportunity, and thank you for spending uh, a part of our of your day with us. Uh, I hope that we will be able to uh, uh, answer some of your questions and uh, that you will enjoy this uh, this uh, webinar and will find it useful uh, for your your practice. So. Uh, uh, of course, um, uh, very interesting to uh, to have this uh, appalling question. 75% uh, uh, roughly of, of, of you answered that yes, you take this dimension, which is the skin barrier management uh, uh, um, in your, uh, I would say, um, uh, in your sun, sun care uh, strategy. So uh, I hope my talk will, will, will also shed more light why this part is important. And uh, from our end, uh, we started with a simple question. Um, let me see if my up. And the simple question is the following. Does the real life daily UV impact the skin barrier integrity? And if so, how? So we will be sharing with you a condensed vitro and clinical research. Most of this research is currently in press and will be published in the coming two months. Now, as you all know, the UV exposure dose depends on different factors. You have the location, you have the season, time of the day. And historically, the research in this space 
used extreme UV exposure conditions or animal models with different studies showing sometimes inconsistent and inconclusive results, making it really very hard to translate this research to physiological conditions and to assess the importance of a proper skincare routine to protect from sun exposure induced damage. So we got interested in the skin barrier impact of normal activities such as having a picnic in the park, uh, a stroll on the beach, uh, walking around Central Park in New York City during a sunny summer day. So for that reason, we used in our studies that I'll be sharing with you in a moment, a physiologically relevant UV dose between two to three MED, which equates to a couple of hours of sun exposure in New York City during the summertime, bringing the exposure and its intensity closer to what most of your patients are experiencing daily. Let me see. Up. Here you are. And so, so as, as nicely reviewed by, by, by Dr. Haftek, uh, there is in fact limited evidence that elucidates the relationship between unprotected UV exposure and skin barrier integrity. We started by developing a human ex vivo model, uh, bringing us closer to mimicking real life conditions in regards to UV exposure. Skin tissue obtained by elective abdominoplasty procedures was treated either with or without a ceramide containing broad spectrum sunscreen. Then using a solar simulator, the tissue was exposed to a daily physiological UV dose over the course of one week. That tissue was maintained at the air liquid interface for a total of eight days. And then structural and molecular properties such as cellular stress, cell junctions, barrier related markers were subsequently evaluated. Uh, first, we evaluated the stress level after the UV exposure in this ex vivo model. Here, we've used regular histology like the HNE staining, the ones that you all did in our past and we are still doing, in fact, to look at the overall structural stress. But also, we tried to assess the stress at the cellular level uh, by doing some tunnel staining, which detects the apoptotic cells. So, as expected, the histology sections show an impact on the overall tissue structure. Uh, you can see it here clearly in the middle segment of my slide, uh, especially when we compare it to the untreated control. The 3-MED daily treatment shows a severe impact on the integrity of the tissue at different levels, from the stratum corneum, where we can see the accumulation of damaged cells, uh, all the way to the dermal epidermal junction, where we can notice kind of a fragility at the junctional level. And overall, we can notice, even if you just glimpse at the epidermis here, you can notice that we have more cells showing uh, a higher number of vacuoles. Now, at the cellular level, this tunnel staining that I'm showing you at the bottom side of my slide um, shows clearly an accumulation of apoptotic cells, especially in the epidermis stained here. As you can see, probably I'm going to try to show you here just in, in, in this kind of, if you can follow my mouse, we have a huge accumulation of these apoptotic cells. So the use of ceramide containing a broad spectrum sunscreen, which is presented on the right side of my slide, be it on the histology or on the immunostaining, protects the tissue from such effects as shown for, for these two conditions, where we can see clearly a healthier, more kind of a protected uh, uh, epidermis. Now, Next, we try to use uh, more kind of deeper, uh, uh, or we try to take a deeper look, and we use kind of a transmission electron microscopy to evaluate skin ultrastructural uh, um, uh, um, uh, signatures, uh, as shown in the upper part of the slide. Now, of course, um, uh, looking at the untreated control, which is the upper left side of my slide, you can see the key components of a healthy epidermis. Um, uh, some of them were touched by uh, 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 Dr. Aftek earlier. You can see different layers from the stratum corneum to this transition layer to the stratum granulosum. In addition, you can clearly notice uh, key components of a healthy epidermis, like keratoyalin granules, here showed in yellow arrow. Um, I hope you can see this yellow arrow on my screen. Um, uh, lamellar bodies in red arrow, uh, desmosomes and corneal desmosomes in green and blue, the ones exactly that, that uh, Dr. Hafek was, was referring to as key component of the integrity of the epidermis. Now, following the UV exposure, which is in the middle segment of the slide, 
we see clearly changes to our keratin fibers, a reduction in the keratohyalin granules, and disruption to the cell junctions. Now, we went deeper in this disruption to the cell junctions, and we tried to confirm by immunofluorescence analysis of one of the proteins that uh, Dr. Haftek mentioned, which is the desmoglein 1. And this is the immunof immunofluorosaining at the bottom part of my slide. So desmoglein is a desmosomal protein that helps maintain the structure of the epidermis. As you can notice, in the untreated skin, we see expression throughout the epidermis from, you know, pretty much in all different layers of this epidermis. Now, when we expose the skin to this UV, we see a huge reduction in this desmoglein 1 expression, aligning with the disrupted junctions visualized by the transmission electron microscopy on the upper side of my slide. Now, ceramide containing SPF protects the skin cell junctions as seen through both um, electron microscopy and immunofluorescence staining. Now, our next step here, um, beyond demonstrating that the cellular junction are extremely susceptible to UV. Um, now we thought, okay, that's great. And um, uh, since these cellular junctions are being impacted severely by UV means um, they can, of course, overall weaken the skin barrier as, as a whole. And, and so to sum it up, this first vitro part, if I may, uh, the ex vivo model that we've developed provided physiologically relevant evidence of UV-induced barrier disruption. Uh, as a reminder, the dose used here is relatable, again, to everyday actions your patients may experience, which uncovers how frequent and how easy, in a way, UV-induced damage really occurs. You have seen with me today that unprotected sun exposure induces signs of epidermal cellular stress and also significant impact on the skin barrier as observed through damage to the cell junctions. Although today I'm not showing you guys um, the, um, the full scope of the studies that are leading, uh, but uh, uh, the irradiated skin at elevated levels also, um, uh, in fact, had increased levels of transglutaminase, which is a hallmark of compromised skin barrier as previously demonstrated in the uh, SLS challenge skin model. The functional implications of such a change in this marker has also been illustrated in patients suffering from atopic dermatitis, from psoriasis, uh, where legional uh, tissues show increase in transglutaminase 1 and transglutaminase 3. So the observed similarities in skin barrier changes between UV exposure and patients suffering from skin disorders further illustrates the importance of adequate photoprotection to prevent the alteration of barrier structure after receiving extended sunlight exposure. So please don't hesitate to refer to all the papers I'm mentioning on the bottom side of my slides for any additional information. Now, uh, this uh, closes the uh, vitro, uh, I would say, uh, work that we have performed. And we wanted to go, I would say, a step further and assess how these UV-induced biological or molecular changes translate clinically. And to do so, we designed a clinical study to investigate the impact of this physiological dose of daily UV on skin surface barrier properties by evaluating relevant clinical endpoints such as erythema, hyperpigmentation, skin hydration, and transient epithelial water loss, as well as assessing biomarkers from uh, this uh, skin uh, by using tape stripping before and after exposure. And of course, we took the opportunity to evaluate on top of this the protective effects of ceramide containing formulations following this very same UV exposure. Now, our clinical design consisted on a monocenter, double blind, randomized study. We completed the study with 16 healthy subjects aged between 18 and 50 years old with skin Fitzpatrick phototype um, uh, three. For uh, irradiation, we used as it's indicated on the slide, uh, a mini zone back model where subjects were irradiated with a single UV dose at 2 MED. Uh, our evaluations included expert grading, instrumentations, uh, tape stripping analysis for skin surface barrier related properties. Now, our ceramide containing formulations were applied in a routine manner. 
with on one end a ceramide containing SPF 25 applied 15 minutes before UV exposure and a ceramide containing moisturizer applied immediately after UV and once a day for up to 14 days. Each subject had a control zone where there's no UV, a UV zone which was irradiated and a zone that was again pre-treated with SPF, irradiated with UV and then treated with moisturizer for 14 days. The first clinical endpoint that uh, we evaluated was skin color. And here on the left uh, side of my slide, um, I'm showing you the clinical grading for erythema and pigmentation. And on the right side, we have the representative images highlighting the skin color change induced by UV between uh, treatments over time. Uh, I hope you can see these, uh, uh, these changes in color. I can see them on my screen, but, but uh, I hope you can also catch the same thing. But we find overall that relevant daily dose of UV induces noticeable and statistically significant erythema after 24 hours and a hyperpigmentation response, which lasted uh, up to 14 days, as you can see here on the left side of the screen. Treatment with the ceramide containing product routine, both again, the SPF and moisturizer, effectively protects against immediate erythema and reduces long lasting hyperpigmentation by keeping it at a minimal level 14 days after UV exposure. Now, next, we investigated the impact of UV on skin barrier by assessing skin hydration and this transepidermal water loss. In our clinical study, UV causes no relevant change in skin hydration levels, uh, but also we can see that treatment with, of course, ceramide containing product routine significantly improves skin hydration 24 hours after UV exposure and up to 14 days. For the transepithelial water loss, we did not observe any relevant changes in both conditions, or in the three conditions I have said, which is in a way not surprising if you read all the conflicting reports out there in the literature where, depending on the UV dose and skin type, the transepithelial water loss results can be sometimes inconclusive and not be a sensitive, I would say, parameter for skin barrier damage for such a short-term real-life exposure. So after evaluating traditional clinical endpoints related to skin surface barrier properties, we kind of wanted to take a closer look at the skin barrier quality and morphology by focusing on the epidermal turnover as explained by, by Dr. Haftek uh, earlier. Uh, this turnover is very key in the maturity of the stratum corneum and in the strong, uh, I would say, uh, defense mechanisms of the skin. And so, um, Roughly, the turnover of the epidermis normally proceeds in about four weeks. During that time, the corneocytes, which are essentially keratinocytes in their final stages of differentiation, are part of the stratum corneum for about two weeks before being shed from the skin surface via desquamation. Now, under normal condition, there is a kind of a delicate balance between basal cell proliferation and desquamation, which was kind of shown to be essential to maintain the barrier integrity and function in the healthy epidermis and the healthy skin in general. So corneocytes undergo a maturation process within the stratum corneum. This maturation step is kind of key as it ensures that the cell layer that forms the, 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 the final barrier and interface with the environment is solid, is of a good quality, and mechanically is kind of a resilient um, uh, kind of um, uh, um, barrier. So, hence for us, corneocyte maturation and morphology are two endpoints that can be evaluated to study skin barrier integrity. So, we used two techniques here. We've used uh, first scanning lacrimal microscopy and then immunofluorescence. Um, and here I'm showing you just a sample of the scanning lacrimal microscopy or SEM, uh, where, uh, where we have an image of a healthy corneocytes. Um, uh, you can see that they normally have kind of a hexagonal shape, okay? And just below this, you see a staining, or double immunostaining for corneocyte maturation, where mature keratinocytes are stained in red, with, with Nile red, and immature corneocytes um, are stained in green, uh, and the staining for green is for, for involucrine. So we evaluated, in a way, the skin barrier quality by assessing this corneocyte maturation, and also by looking at the morphology 
using, in fact, the tape stripping samples that we took from uh, from our clinical um, uh, from our clinical uh, study. Now, and this is the, the pretty much the results that we obtained. The upper panel shows you representative images of corneal sac maturation with the three conditions, 14 days post UV exposure. And um, uh, as you can see here, uh, again, immature corneocytes are in green, mature corneocytes are in red, okay? And the graph below um, shows you the quantification of that stain. So, although as you can see here, we did not reach um, a statistical significance we observed that a real life single dose of UV, again, uh, this is very important. It's a single dose of UV tends to accelerate corneocyte maturation. If you see in the middle segment and the upper side of my slide, you see more red in a way. Uh, uh, and if you get closer to the slide, you can see it even better. And, and that means that we are accelerating this corneocyte maturation. 14 days, of course, after UV exposure. This disruption or kind of an imbalance can be considered potentially a compensatory mechanism that the skin barrier kind of used to adapt uh, and, and, and reinforce its, its response um, uh, to this UV stress to prevent subsequent damage. But as you can see from the staining, some of the red cells do not have a uniform shape. Some of them are nicely hexagonal, as you can see, but some of them are kind of elongated. Some of them are kind of different shapes. Um, that suggests that there is somewhere an imbalance in the maturation process. It's true there is an acceleration, but we believe that there is an acceleration combined with a imbalance in the process itself. Now, when we treat um, uh, with the ceramide containing products routine, we, 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 we see that we prevent this acceleration and this deformity from happening. And if you compare the last uh, immunofluorescent staining on, on the right side uh, of this slide to the control, you see first less mature cells, the staining of the red staining is less important and the shape is more beautiful. It mimics the non-exposed um, uh, skin, right? So here to sum it in a, in a good way, I think the disruption of the corneocyte shape um, uh, led us to assess more specifically the corneocyte morphology. So when we had those look at this immunofluorescence and we thought, okay, why this is elongated, why it's accelerated. So we went into a deeper analysis. And to do so, we used a scanning electron microscopy. Um, again, you know, looking at our tape stripping samples. The upper panel here shows you a representative images of corneocytes. And the graph below will show you the quantification of the normal shaped cells uh, in these three conditions, okay? so. Our interest here is if you follow me on the upper left side of my slide, you see that I have nicely hexagonal cells. Now, once we move into 3-MED UV, we see that these cells are losing their, uh, uh, their, their, their shape. They are kind of merging together and, and um, uh, they, they don't, they, we, we don't see the borders of the cells. We feel like there are cells are merging into one big space, right? So again, when we looked at our relevant daily dose of UV, um, uh, um, uh, we see a huge reduction of this normally differentiated corneocytes. Uh, and it's both one day after one day of exposure. And this shape persisted up to 14 days post UV exposure. And again, I remind you guys, this is one exposure, okay? So at day one and by day 14, treatment with ceramide containing products routine significantly, I would say, preserved the appearance of well-differentiated uh, corneocytes as compared to the no UV condition. Again, you compare the first and the last one, they look similar. The shape of the cells are there. The, 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 form, the uniformity of this hexagonal is the dominant uh, uh, shape that we can see. So together, these results suggest that the ceramide containing products routine, in fact, effectively protects skin surface barrier integrity by maintaining normal corneocyte maturation, but also maintaining this morphological features after UV exposure. Now, I 
I would like probably to one of the few uh, slides that I still have to, to share with you guys, just a summary of our clinical results here. Um, I would say physiological doses of UV exposure can damage skin barrier properties by inducing inflammatory response and altering skin color, as we've seen, and disrupting skin cell surface morphological organization and maturation. And once we treat with a ceramide containing uh, sunscreen and moisturizer routine, we can notice that first we reduce the erythema and hyperpigmentation, we improve and offer long lasting skin hydration, and we maintain this normal superficial skin cell morphology and turnover after UV exposure. So um, I hope I can convince you guys that our clinical results here highlight that barrier enforcing lipid formulations such as ceramides can provide additional benefits in patients' daily routine by kind of strengthening the barrier and improving skin health overall against chronic sun exposure. Now, uh, I will uh, leave it now back to uh, Dr. Haftek uh, to uh, take us through the last part of our uh, webinar uh, today. Mike, I'll leave it back to you. Hi, thank you very much. Very, very, very exciting results indeed. So, well, uh, some conclusions maybe on what you've said and uh, uh, based on uh, our knowledge on, uh, on um, skin physiology. Uh, but before that, maybe you'll have uh, another polling question. Roxanne? Uh, I'm going to go through a couple of slides first. Okay, first. So, uh, here you can see, uh, well, the results of our uh, understanding of, uh, of the UV impact on, uh, on, the, on the barrier and its restoration and uh, how to um, incorporate and how to use the knowledge that we have uh, to improve the uh, the use of uh, sunscreens and uh, uh, combine the protective role of uh, sunscreens with the barrier restoration effects um, through the implementation of these uh, additional uh, healing and restructuring uh, uh, function of ceramides in the products. Um, in our belief, indeed, uh, the combining the two elements is essential for, uh, on a long run, uh, in the fight against uh, uh, sun-induced uh, um, aging of uh, of the skin, uh, not only uh, to prevent uh the, the acute results of, of sun exposure when you overexpose yourself during the hours that are not uh, uh, really um, known as uh, as uh, as the hours that you should be exposed to uh, to the sun but also uh, on the long term uh, you can see here that uh, uh, ceramide con containing sun care, uh, containing uh, also sunscreen and uh, provides the moisturizing, moisturizing uh, effects and uh, uh, while still protecting against uh, acute uh, uh, sunburn. Um, well, these uh, Acute results of uh, of uh, sun exposures are uh, erythema and hyperpigmentation, and these uh, ceramides included into uh, the products may uh, help to prevent uh, this um, um, the erythema and hyperpigmentation and improve skin hydration and. Uh, uh, may be also uh, essential uh, for um, um, redu reducing the impact on, of, of UVs on, 
on that heavy uh, adhesive junctions like desmosome and chronia desmosomes. Well, uh, he, as uh, Dr. Buez have uh, uh, mentioned, uh, there is uh, uh, an impact of uh, UVs that results in uh, increased maturation of the stratum corneum. Uh, this increased maturation of the stratum corneum uh, uh, is observed during uh, uh, vacation time when people expose themselves to uh, to the sun, and when they come back, uh, their uh, skin usually is uh, uh, more keratinized. Uh, stratum corneum is uh, uh, reinforced, and this results, for example, in acne patients. Uh, in the increased uh, keratinization around the follicles and uh, uh, maybe uh, worsening of the of the um, of the acne uh, generally speaking i can see that uh, uh, <laughs> i have to ask you another polling question uh, now which is after what you've heard from dr buez and this will be the following with what you learned today, will you manage your patient's uh, sun care uh, strategy any differently? Uh, let's see what are your answers. I would say yes. Well, that, uh, that's uh, what I've expected, <laughs> especially the five no uh, results. Uh, thank you very much for, for this. Uh, and uh, I think that, uh, yes, uh, well, you will receive uh, the, the information in two days. Uh, Absolutely. So we'll be, just reminding you that you all received the recording of this important meeting by email one to two days later. And it's also available on cerave.com and rbcconsultants.com. Again, if you have any questions, just type them in in the question pane. I see we've got a couple of questions. Uh, you can also submit questions afterward at info at rbcconsultants.com. And again, we'd like to thank our sponsor, CeraVe for making this educational event possible. So just a couple of questions, uh, Dr. Haftek and Buez. The first question, um, I guess it would go to Dr. Haftek um, in the sense that is the skin barrier damage observed with UV exposure consistent with the skin barrier alteration observed in skin disease like atopic dermatitis? Of course it is. <laughs> there is no question about that. Uh, well, uh, atopic dermatitis is an inflammatory disease, so uh, there is some improvement of uh, of skin lesions with UV exposure. However, as you could see, there is a, a defect of the barrier also in non 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 lesional skin. So uh, the Improving the barrier, generally speaking, in these patients uh, will uh, will be important uh, for uh, the long term uh, um, treatment of uh, of atopic dermatitis. Uh, now, as you could see, also UV would uh, uh, worsen uh, the uh, on the long term uh, the uh, the state of uh, of the barrier. So um, counterbalancing this with uh, uh, the prop appropriate um, uh, background to like like uh, uh, those uh, lipids that are incorporated into the into the sunscreens uh, is essential for uh, for uh, for the treatment and uh, sun care of those uh, patients and not only of those patients but also in uh, uh, in the patients in the in the people that uh, that uh, uh, do not uh, present uh, skin lesions 
Uh, I think that uh, Dr. Buez would uh, maybe uh, uh, add some words about that. No, you're absolutely right, uh, Dr. Aftek. I think uh, I think we, we we see a lot of similarities, um, uh, in fact, and, and we have an upcoming also work uh, that goes exactly uh, with what you are saying. We see a lot of similarities between uh, some pathological conditions and their signatures when it comes to uh, um, uh, ceramide dynamic um, uh, with uh, what we see uh, once we expose the skin uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to the UV. Uh, that means that uh, for us, at least, um, uh, we might have a way first, as, as I shared with you guys, is that the models that we are developing, be it vitro or clinical, will allow us to understand better how this is evolving. Even one single exposure is leading to, uh, to, to, to such a change. Uh, but of course, similarities are there between a pathological condition, uh, and here we are talking about atopic dermatitis or psoriasis, and uh, um, an exposure to an aggressor, which is a UV um, uh, in our daily in our daily life. Absolutely. We have another question um, to mm -hmm. Dr. Buez. The relationship between skin barrier and ceramide was explained. Knowing that the UV exposure can cause damage to the skin barrier, can we imagine that ceramide levels are also negatively impacted by UV exposure? It's it, in fact, it's also ties nicely with the previous question. I think uh, absolutely. Um, uh, so first, if we step back, we, and we we just uh, we just shared with you guys the, the the detrimental impact of UV on the overall epidermal homeostasis, right? So, um, and here we assessed a number of critical barrier related markers. We we talked about cell junction differentiation, uh, and also um, uh, we touched base on the ultra structural changes. Uh, shortly after sun exposure, right? So we asked ourselves this very same question. Uh, is the ceramide total level at the skin surface is impacted by UV exposure? That's one thing. The second question that we are asking also is, if yes, which ceramides and how means, do we see an up regulation or a down regulation? Because the question, if I took it well, is negatively. Uh, negatively means probably is that decrease, increase. So we asked this very same question. In fact, to answer this question, what we are trying to do, and we are currently publishing this work, we did um, perform um, uh, lipidomics studies where uh, we, we, we went back to, uh, uh, to the tape stripping and we tried to evaluate uh, what is out there, what is present from a lipid standpoint, uh, what are the ceramides that are present, how the total ceramides. And so before, and after UV exposure. So we, in fact, have observed a very interesting dynamic uh, 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 things and actions uh, happening um, when it comes to the level of, uh, uh, of, uh, of ceramides. I think uh, if you follow Dr. Haftek's presentation at a certain point, uh, he presented this table where we have, you know, different pathological conditions and what's the impact on the total ceramides. And then uh, if you dig a little bit deeper, you saw that uh, uh, there is an impact on uh, the um, uh, you know long chain ceramides uh, where we, for instance, in atopic dermatitis, we keeping it on the atopic dermatitis, we see a decrease of long chain ceramides, but we see an increase of the short chain uh, ceramides, right? Uh, and this is what I meant by ne what negatively impacting means, because it can be it's a dynamic. And in fact, to put it in a simple terms, we kind of seen similar dynamics once we expose the skin to this UV. So of course, I cannot talk more. The process is in, in publication and I, we will share it with you, but, uh, but stay tuned. But just to tell you that absolutely, uh, this is something that we are seeing. This is something that with the evolution also of these technologies like lipidomics, we can do like kind of a mapping of all these lipids and ceramides at the skin surface and really see which ones are going up or up-regulated and which ones are down-regulated. So stay tuned. The, this work will be published this year. Absolutely. And to that point, please look out at the, the Journal of Drugs and Dermatology for a supplement with many of the points presented to, today uh, from Dr. Haftek and Buez, and it will be open access as well. So we'd like to thank Dr. Haftek and Buez for this really enlightening presentation on new research on the impact of sun exposure in skin barrier. And please join us for our next skin chat, which is going to be on April 13th with Dr. Hilary Baldwin, as well as Dr. Julie Harper on the impact of skin barrier in rosacea patients. So thank you all again for joining us.
Good night. Good day. Good, good morning. Thank you, Roxanne. Thank you, Roxanne. Bye now. Bye bye. All right.